I love that, don't you? What a beautiful night that Christ was born. Father, I pray that you would remind us tonight of how special that is to us. God, thank you that we have a place that we can gather, that we have a space that we can worship you, that we can bring you praise. And I pray that you be glorified tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. You sound good. And it is good to, to hear this room full. Um, in case you don't know anything about Summit, um, we're so glad that you're here. I'm, I'm Travis, uh, the lead pastor here at Summit, and thankful that we get to celebrate Christmas with you today. And this is our first Christmas Eve service in this new space. And so thank you for being a part of it and making it special with us. It's, um, I, I told the worship team this morning, you know, a lot, part of me, a big part of me feels like it's still May 14th and this is our first service together, um, but it's not. It's December 24th and we've been here for about seven months, but, um, you know, there's just something special about having a big uh, service like Christmas Eve uh, here um, with you all, and so thank you for joining us for that. We look forward to seeing you on Easter, um, to, to come back and <laughs> celebrate our first Easter gathering together. I didn't mean it like that, but that's how you took it. <laughs> I, I promise I didn't intend to slam you uh, this evening. That was not my goal, um, but uh, it's good to be together. Luke chapter 2, Ashley already read um, part of this, but I wanted to just point our attention there tonight, if it's okay. And instead of starting in, in verse 1, I'm actually going to start in verse 8. Is that all right with you? Yeah, good, because I'm the one with the mic, so just don't forget that. Luke chapter 2, this is Dr. Luke. Luke was a doctor. He was very descriptive, and I believe that's one of the reasons why we get so much of the Christmas story in the book of Luke. And Luke records in verse 8 that in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, around about them, as Charlie Brown says. Right? Can you imagine that picture? They were filled as a result with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Everybody say all. 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 You know what all means in the Greek there? All. All. It means everyone, which reminds me of John 3.16, doesn't it? Many of you know John 3.16 probably, that for God so loved the world, and the world there meant everyone, right? For God so loved everyone that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And so the angel coming and saying, fear not, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people, for unto you. This day is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now I want you to remember that because that's where we're going to hone in tonight for the rest of our time together. But let's keep reading. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. I love that, don't you? I love that. When you're going to something expectantly, right, you don't just, you don't just kind of casually get there, right? You go with haste. You go with haste to get there. You're excited to be there. You're excited to see the thing that, that you're celebrating. They went with haste. Um, uh, whoa, 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 there it is. They went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered. They worshiped at what the sh shepherds had told them. They were in awe. But Mary, Mary, I love this, treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God 
for all they'd heard and seen as it had been told them. So I mentioned to you a few moments ago that I wanted to focus in on a certain part of this passage tonight. And it's our three points, essentially. We're going to let the Bible do the speaking tonight, if that's all right. But it says, fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. We already talked about that. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And I want to focus in on the implications of those three titles that this angel gives this baby at Christmas. Because I think they have huge implications for us that sometimes we miss, or sometimes it's just a cute thing that we say or a sweet thing that we say around Christmas time. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. But what does each of those things mean for us tonight? Because I'm sure each and every one of you walked in here wondering that exact thing, didn't you? This means yes. This means no. Humor me tonight. It's Christmas. Okay? So the first thing the angel says is a Savior. What kind of Savior is Jesus? Well, the kind of Savior who not only deserves our gratitude, but wins our love. Right? We talked about love this morning, or as we said it this morning, love. Right? You'll have to go listen to it. It was, it was all right. Okay? He's the kind of rescuer who plucks us from the fire. He's the kind of rescuer who, he, who is himself the waters of life. He's not like a lifeguard who saves us from the undertow to hand us off to our family, but like our own father who rescues us for, from the riptide for himself to give us the longest, sweetest, most memorable hug we've ever had. His rescue is not like that of a paramedic, a fireman, a police officer, or a soldier honorably just doing their job, but his rescue In his rescue, he demonstrates his personal, covenantal, eternal love for us. And our salvation doesn't show his commitment to his work as much as it shows his commitment to his child. Our salvation doesn't show his commitment to his work as much as it does his commitment to his child. He's not just Savior, but also treasure. He's the kind of Savior who, as Luke puts it in Luke chapter 12, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. He is our personal rescue. That's what it means that Jesus came as Savior. And then the angel says, not only Savior, but who is Christ. So Jesus Christ combines his name Jesus with his title Christ, meaning Jesus the anointed one, or Jesus, the chosen one. Jesus is the human name as announced to Mary by the angel Gabriel in Luke chapter 1, and Christ is his title as the chosen, anointed Son of God. This is significant because in the Old Testament, they predicted that God would send a chosen one, the Messiah, to save the world. As early as the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve that a seed of the woman would someday come and destroy sin and darkness. The Psalms of David and the prophecies of Daniel describe the work and coming of the Messiah whom God would send to save His people from their sins. And the Jewish people knew that the Messiah was coming, but they misunderstood what He was coming to do. They believed the Messiah, the Christ, would come to set up a kingdom on earth, so to speak. And deliver them from their Roman masters. But Jesus Christ came to deliver them from a bondage much worse than their bondage to Rome. Jesus came to deliver them and us from the bondage of sin. And as the Christ, Jesus was God's anointed one who fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. The chosen one who came to save us from sin. And the one who was promised to come again to usher us into eternity into His everlasting kingdom. So that's Jesus as Savior, Jesus as the Christ, and then thirdly, Jesus as the Lord. What kind of Lord is Jesus? Well, the kind who not only deserves our obedience, but wins our admiration. Isn't that awesome? He's the kind of King we not only acknowledge with our taxes and military service, but with our adoration and delight. He's not a selfish 
Lord, but a self-sacrificing Lord. He's not a mean Lord, but a kind one. He's not a mean Lord, but a kind one. He's also the kind of Lord who is our greatest treasure. A Lord so good that we would sell all that we have to be His people, giving ourselves to the treasure that He is. As Matthew puts it in Matthew chapter 13, He is our pearl of greatest price. Not only have we seen that He's powerful, but we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, as 1 Peter puts it. He is the kind of Lord in whom we delight. And so Jesus is Savior, like we talked about first, emphasizes that we're forgiven because of Jesus. Jesus as Lord emphasizes a reorientation of life, that He is in control over our lives. Jesus as Savior affects only the so-called spiritual aspects of life, while Jesus as Lord affects all of our lives. And so, as we look at this, that Jesus is Savior, who is Christ, the Lord, I want to show you from Isaiah chapter 9 why this is so important. In the book of Isaiah, we read this prophecy, this foretelling of Jesus' coming. And Isaiah writes that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The beauty of Christmas Eve service is that we celebrate light. That's why we do candlelight in a few moments. That's why we kind of dim the lights and put all of our attention on the the, the burning flames. It's because we're celebrating Jesus' light because the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. You've multiplied the nation. You've increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they were glad when they Divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of His government and of peace, there will be no end. Aren't you thankful for that? On the throne of David and over His kingdom, to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. See, the light that Isaiah talks about in Isaiah chapter 9, the light is accomplishing this victory Through Jesus. Because Jesus, as Philippians 2 puts it, Paul writing to the church at Philippi, because Jesus stepped out of heaven. He humbled himself by being born in human form, which is what we celebrate at Christmas. And then he humbled himself again by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so Jesus is this light that we needed. Look at your neighbor and say, you need a light. Not that kind of light. Okay, I don't want somebody's like, bummer. No, that's, that's deacon ministry in the Baptist church in the 80s and 90s, okay? All right. But I want to look tonight what our response is to the light. And the first response we have to the light is this, repentance. Now, repentance is where we make ourselves right before God, Right? In verse 3, Isaiah gives a vivid description of the people's response to the light. He says, you've multiplied the nation. You've increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy in the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoil. You've enlarged the nation and increased their joy. Rejoicing because the Lord has delivered them. See, after we repent... God restores to us, as it says in Psalm 51, the joy of our salvation. Now, let's be honest in church on Christmas Eve, okay? Let me remind you, you're in church. Have you ever done something really bad that was hard to admit, but once you admitted it, you were so thankful and relieved that you had? Anybody else, or am I the only one? Okay, I'm seeing those hands. Hallelujah, I'm not alone. 
right? When we make ourselves right with the people that we've wronged, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? There's such a relief in that. There's a rejoicing. There's a celebration almost inside of us that goes on when we are made right again, when we are made whole again in that relationship that obviously meant something to us, right? And in the same way, in the same way, when we respond to the light who is Jesus in repentance and getting right before Him, that's what righteousness means, being right before God, there's a rejoicing, which is our second response to the light. We see rejoicing. Despite all that we've said about Jesus being the light of the world, Jesus himself says something curious in Matthew chapter 5 when he tells his disciples, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. No one, after lighting a lamp, Jesus says, puts it under a basket, but on a lampstand and gives, it to, gives light to all the house. Right? Many of you probably lost power this past week. And we were running around trying to find flashlights and lights to keep everybody happy and safe. And we've got, we've got four kids in our house, 15, 13, 8, and 6. And the 15 and 13-year-old, they're okay when the power goes out. They're, they, don't, they don't cry near as much as they used to. But the 8 and 6-year-old kind of still get a little nervous and, and panic a little bit. And so on Monday when we lost power, they were... They were, they were a little nervous and they wanted lights in their room, a flashlight. We went in like 90 minutes after one of the kids had fallen asleep to turn off the light. And as soon as the light went off, boom. Why did you turn my light off, right? Why did you turn the light off? And then it was interesting because the next night when we told them we got power back. Yes, we only lost power for like 24 hours. I know some of you lost power for a lot more and you want to throw something at me right now, but that's okay. Um... Uh, the next night when we told him we had received power back, it was, it was amazing because of the disappointment that they heard, right? They, the disappointment we heard because they were like, oh, we liked not having power. We liked, we, we liked being able to see the stars in our living room and to enjoy the simpler things in life. And I was like, great, no toys for you. Simple, right? That's what we're getting for Christmas this year. Simple. But Jesus, being the light of the world, when we light a lamp, when we, when we turn on a lamp, we don't put something over it to cover up the light, do we? That's missing the point. In the same way, we let our light shine, the light of Jesus, before the world. 1 Peter 2 tells us to proclaim the mighty acts of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. Light. And then our third response to the light is this, to share it with others. To share it with others. Since nothing can extinguish the light of Jesus, nothing, nothing, nothing can extinguish the light of Jesus. Because it's not a light that we create ourselves, it's a light that was placed there. It's the very first thing that God made in Genesis chapter 1. It says, let there be light, and there was light. And Genesis is talking about the light of the stars and the sun and the moon. But it's not hard to move from this to talk about Jesus as the light of the world, is it? God is responsible for the light because God is the light. And through Jesus, He has come into this world, as Genesis also says, to separate the light from the darkness. And He's done this for us. And so my prayer for each and every one of us tonight is that we would continue walking in the light that those around us may know what God has done for us and therefore what God has done for them. Jesus came. We've been talking about Advent. We conclude it tonight. He's come with peace, with hope, with joy, with love. And He's come to change our world and to change us forever. While there was still time, she wrapped him in clothes, placed him in a manger, because there was no room available for them in the end. When you think about the birth of Jesus, it's such a humble birth, such a lowly beginning to life. 
and yet such a normal entry into our existence that the Son of God, Jesus, arrives in this world as a fragile, helpless baby. Jesus, being one of us, able to understand everything we go through, all of our longings, all of our struggles, all of our pain, and yet Jesus is God. And so tonight, as I close, before we go into our candlelight time, I want to read this to you. Jesus is closer than the closest person to you. A lot of times in the church we say Jesus is closer than a brother. That's a little interesting to me in context because my favorite Christmas memories as a kid were that Christmas Day was the only time my brother and I got along. And so when I think of Jesus being closer than a brother, well, let's just say I need different context. Right? I love my brother, both of them. Right? I'm not talking about this one over here. Andy's great. He never talks back. But, um, but Christmas was the only time that my other brother Brian and I would get along. But I want you to think about Jesus being closer than the closest person to you in your life. And in that context, hear this. He's closer in our uncertainties, our struggles, our discouragement, and our differences. He's closer in our celebration and in our mourning. He's closer in our crying and in our rejoicing. He's closer in our fear and in our triumphs. He's closer in our losses and our victories. He's closer in our brokenness and our healing. He's closer in our sickness and our health. He's there. He's with you. The literal thing that we celebrate at Christmas is Jesus is in our world and in our lives. He's Emmanuel, God with us for eternity. And so as the worship team comes tonight, hear me say this to each and every one of you, because I don't know that I'll have been able to see each and every one of you, greet every one of you, but hear this from me. Pastor of Summit, for most of you, your pastor, which is one of the greatest joys of my life. Merry Christmas. Jesus has come. He is among us. He's with us. And I look forward to when He will come again. Will you pray with me? And so tonight, I know it's Christmas Eve. I know that I know that some of you are here because you were told you had to be. I know that some of you are here because this is what you do. This is the tradition. I know that some of you are here because you're searching for something. I know that some of you are here for all kinds of reasons. But I want you to know that whatever that reason is, God meets us exactly where we are. And so if you're here tonight in a room like this, forgive me, I'm not some radical preacher or anything like that, but I do want to give you an opportunity to meet Jesus tonight. And so if you're sitting in this room and you say, Travis, tonight I need that God with us. I need Jesus in my life. I'm not going to do any big spectacle or drag this out, but if that's you, nobody's looking around except me. Would you just lift up your hand right now? You can put it right back down. Anybody at all? Okay. Anybody else? All right. Anybody else? Yep. Anybody else? Yep. Yep. Anybody else? Okay. If that was you, again, not dragging this out, I want you to pray this prayer. And just repeat it after me in your heart and mind. The God that searches hearts and minds will hear you. Just say, dear Jesus, I need you. I need the light. I'm tired of walking in darkness. And so would you come into my life and live in me forever? In Jesus' name I pray. And God, for the rest of us, I pray tonight that we would look to you, the light of the world. God, that we wouldn't just keep our light hidden 
but that we'd share it with others. That we would rejoice in it. And that Christmas would be different tomorrow. Because we're placing you at the center. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.